something just slightly different today, inspired by a recent Murphy's Law setback that I had over in the other fat cave. I'm turning something on my lathe and all of a sudden the chuck starts binding and it feels all crunchy inside. It's obviously full of chips and Christ knows how much residual grinding dust from its manufacturing process. A good time to pull it apart, service it, get it back together and have it running super slick. Now, you might not have a lathe and you might never foresee yourself pulling apart a lathe chuck, but Odds on, if you've got a shed one day, you are going to be faced with the disassembly of something mechanical that matters. And it might be awfully nice if you get it back together and it works and you don't butcher it on the way through. So more broadly, that's what today's video is all about. I fully blame myself for this incident with the chuck because I was working here a little earlier and my Ryobi drill chuck packed up and I thought oh my aren't I just the clever dick because I had a replacement brand new chuck and I installed it and I was going again dude making noise within minutes I went yes half a day later the chuck packed up obviously okay now if you ever have the chuck on your prosumer electric drill fall apart don't throw the whole thing away because you can get a replacement chuck like I got this one from trade tools in Queensland they sent it to me it was about 50 bucks I think and that's a hell of a lot cheaper than an all-new machine and the rest of it appears to be just fine so the way you do that you just shove a Phillips head number two down in the guts of it and you undo the set screw that's way down there that you can see with your flashlight and it's a left hand thread so when you look at it this way it's clockwise to undo that's important you get that out and then you just jam an allen key in here and undo it it's a right hand thread for the spindle it's a uh, half 20 unf on most drills i think anyway it doesn't matter what it means is that the replacement aftermarket chucks you can buy this one is a renegade industrial one and it must be good because it's got a red line right down the guts of it so if it's anything like those canon l series lenses this will last until the heat death of the universe so that's all good you get an allen key you undo it you screw the new one on you whip the left hand set screw back in and you're in business within freaking minutes dude it's poetry and then of course reality thought no no i'm not letting him get away with that <laughs> right then my chuck binds up and i go okay well it's chucky easter then is it so all right what we're going to do here is we're going to pull it apart now this is a standard three jaw lathe chuck it's a self-centering one which means that all the jaws move together and you'll see the workings of it inside in just a bit i won't spoil that for you now but the other kind of course is the four jaw independent chuck where each jaw moves independently and that's good if you want to drill an offset hole or you want to drill a hole not in the center of something so horses for courses these kinds of chucks typically come with every lathe that you will buy and they're pretty simple inside there's only a few moving parts but they are quite complex parts and you need to bear some things in mind these are called scroll chucks as you'll see because there's a dirty big spiral in here that drives the jaws in and out of their slots keyways slideways whatever you want to call them there's a scroll on the front face and there's like a gear wheel with uh, pinions attached to these shafts here where the lathe key goes in. So pinion attached to this, gear wheel in here, scroll goes turny, 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 and the jaws come in and out in a synchronized way. So that's lovely. This is 160 millimeters in diameter. It's from the venerable Toolmaster brand. It says so right here on a red spot. I think you might be able to see that just there. So the only thing that makes it a Toolmaster chuck, I think, is the red spot that they put on it at the end of the production line. I've got this 
vision in my head of a huge factory in China and all it does is it makes these lathe chucks. There's a million a day getting made and there's some poor bastard's job is to put the red sticker on 400 today, Mark Toolmaster, and every one of the other brands just gets its own sticker and therein is the only direct, uh, distinction between the different branded chucks of this ilk. But anyway, it works pretty well. It's good for general engineering work and we're going to pull it apart today. Incidentally, the lathe is a AL960B, which is uh, sold by Hare and Forbes. It's the first of their Taiwanese lathes. And I've got to say that machines from Taiwan are just this much ahead of machines from China. They're just better made. They feel slicker. They've got less backlash. They're more concentric. They're just slicker in every respect. And I'm glad I stumped up the extra bucks and bought the AL960B because when I look at the litany of problems that some other makers have suffered with Chinese machines around the same size, I'm pretty glad I bought that AL960B. And my only relationship with Hare and Forbes is that I've given them money in exchange for machines, right? So it's not like this is a bought comment. This is just my observation about them. Now, it's actually a really good idea if you buy a new machine like a lathe. It's a good idea to pull some of the parts apart initially and, you know, drain the oil because there might be sand and grinding dust in various oil uh, sumps, oil bath type gear drains and things of that nature. And it'd be a good idea to flush that out. And because of the way these are made, they're ground right at the end. There's a lot of grinding takes place in situ, and it means inevitably that there will be some grinding dust inside the chuck. And that's going to increase the wear if you don't get it out uh, reasonably quickly. It's a good idea just to do that, get rid of whatever the problem is, but also clean up the internals at the same time. You know... Otherwise, you'll just be replacing the chuck prematurely, and that's going to cost you money and nobody wants that. So whenever you pull the chuck off a lathe, it's always a really good idea to get a couple of short bits like this of construction lumber, you know, notionally four by twos, and just stick them across the bit of the ways that is under the chuck, right? Because the ways is induction hardened and precision ground. And <laughs> You don't want to drop a dirty big chunk of metal on it from a height of like six inches or something. That's going to end in tears. And the thing is, anytime you move a chuck on or off the lathe or do anything else like that, just put the wood down as a preemptive strike against you fumbling the ball. And then you won't be cursing for hours later and wondering how to repair the ways. Okay, so do that. These, um, these pins, incidentally, on the back here... Uh, called cam lock pins. There's a cam lock attachment system with this uh, particular lathe. And you'll see that there are these little half or round segments ground out of the hardened pins, right? And what happens here is inside this recess is a precision ground tapered registration surface that matches the same male version of that on the spindle of the lathe. When you stick the chuck into the lathe, what happens is those round detents here, they get sucked in like this and it pulls the whole body of the chuck onto the registration surface and just locks it in there. So these pins are a little bit loose. They're held in place with captive uh, socket head cap screws so they can't undo. Their orientation is flexible, but more or less fixed. So they can't be in the wrong place, but they can adapt to the cams. And their purpose is just to provide tension this way so that the chuck goes on to the precision mounting face of the spindle. So a good safety tip with the precision registration surface here is don't let it rust. Don't get some bright idea about cleaning it up with emery paper or anything like that. Leave it pristine and make sure it stays that way. And the same for the nose on the lathe. Those precision surfaces have to stay pristine. Otherwise, you're just going to be casting the accuracy of your machine into the pit of hell, which nobody in their right mind would want. Now, 
what we're going to do now, okay, with all of that preamble out of the way, is we're going to get this apart. We're going to go back in time. I'm going to get this apart and talk you through it. We'll do that in just a sec. This video is sponsored by Sonax. I've been using this Sonax SX90 Plus while the whole fat cave has just been a humid nightmare of flash rusting potential across every surface and on every tool that you'd really rather wasn't rusty. SX90 Plus is a premium German multifunctional oil in a pressure pack. It displaces water and it's got excellent solvent type properties as well. My ghetto flat welding table and the tables on both drill presses, the chucks, numerous other bits and pieces like half built prototypes, Morse taper sleeves, precision blocks, all of the vices, all incessantly rusting across summer and Sonax SX90 Plus has been a real asset there. My somewhat gorgeous and near new drill press just up and carked it over the so-called festive season. One of the main wires inside the motor case just shorted itself out randomly onto the rotor and after that it just tripped the safety switch endlessly and I had this detailed setup in the vise half complete. It took me about three weeks to work up the emotional energy to get to the bottom of it and fix it and of course the whole machine just spent the intervening time corroding. Anyway, the high-tech miracles of Scotch-Brite and SX90 Plus proved to be a great combination for turning this somewhat brown frown upside down. It's really effective and it seems to have a lot of oil in it per spray, unlike some competitors which seem like mainly solvent to me. And it doesn't go all gummy or turn to wax over the next few weeks. The precision nozzle is built in, so there's no fiddling with that little taped on tube that you inevitably lose. And when you fold it, it reverts automatically to a wide spray. I've become a huge fan. SX90 Plus is a premium product from Germany and Sonax does a whole bunch of car care stuff as well. They reached out to me and showed me the test where Auto Build and Build Classic worked with KUS in Germany to test SX90 Plus against competitors across 15 different performance categories. SX90 Plus won the test overall and scored significantly more points than WD40 and Balasol. Go to sonax.com.au now, use the code AUTOEXPERT10 on checkout and you'll get 10% off the entire range of Sonax products. I'll put a link in the description. Sonax SX90 Plus really is awesome stuff for the workshop or in the boot of your car. <laughs> Some people hate those sponsored segments, but I actually used the SX90 Plus getting the lathe back together. All these front surfaces, the scroll and all of that, they're reassembled with a thin film of this. It's a really high quality uh, sprayable oil and the delivery system kind of matters as well because sometimes you just want to get a right Goldilocks amount exactly where you want it and it was extremely helpful here. We'll get to that. Now Sonax is a German company and their main game is car care products, right? And they reached out to me and I went, yeah, okay, I'll have a try of some of that. And this stuff really interests me because it's a huge step up from the products that I had been using. And they're a small operation in Australia. They're a family run import operation, which means they want to grow and they really care. So they'll look after you if you actually uh, go to their website and procure anything from them. I also just tried their wheel cleaner. It's this stuff here called The Beast. <laughs> I don't know what makes it a beast, but it worked really well. You just spray it on you know you make sure your wheels aren't red hot after having just completed a qualifying lap so it's good to do it before you move the car and you just spray it on leave it there for five minutes go and have a coffee or something come back jet of water it rolls off red because it changes color while it's doing its thing and then a chamois and a couple of minutes later clean wheels and personally i hate cleaning my car i particularly hate cleaning wheels but you know, I particularly like having a clean car with clean wheels, so that's a paradox. Anyway, it worked really well, and I suspect it's so simple that perhaps even Chris Bowen could do that, but he's probably got an intern that does that kind of crap for him. 
Now, pulling it apart, the first thing you do is you've got to get the jaws out. The easiest way to do that is you just unwind them fully and when they stop moving, you just pull them out. The important thing about the jaws though is that they're numbered and the slots are numbered and you've got to get them back in the right order. So I just made sure that the jaws were numbered as I pulled them out. The slots are certainly numbered. They've got a number stamped in there. The jaws are engraved, but it's a bit hard to read some of the engraving. So I actually put what's called witness marks, which is just you get your center punch and your center punch three in this case marks on this one for jaw number three. So there's three on the back of the jaw and three on the body right there. And then I put, you know, two here and two here and one here and one here. And that just makes it virtually idiot proof from a reassembly point of view because we've got the engraving on the inside and then we've got the witness marks on the outside. Very hard to get it wrong. One of the reasons for doing this is that when they put the chuck together, they grind the final faces on the jaws in situ. And that's where the concentricity derives from, all right? And if you get them back in the wrong order, dogs and cats living together. So make sure you get the jaws on in the same order. And I'm a bit OCD about reassembly. So I've also witness marked the pinions. This is pinion number one, notionally. I put three here and put two here because obviously I went around in the other direction. The other thing, which you may not be able to see from there and which was really hard to see at the outset, is that this is not all just one block of iron. There is a, a, a cap on the back, right? But because when you buy a chuck brand new, they spin it up and they grind the surface finish at the very end, you can't really see the join here. So if you haven't done this before, you probably scratch your head and go, well, how does it come apart? Because, you know, there's some screws on the back that you can undo, but there's no obvious join line when the chuck is brand new. You can sort of spot it a bit now because it's been apart, but just have a look and see if you can spot it. You have to know what you're looking for. There's um, a few different aspects of chucks, right? On the back of a chuck, Sometimes you've got this cam lock system and sometimes you've got a back plate because there are all different kinds of mounting systems for chucks on lathes. The back plate just unscrews on some chucks and then all you're looking at down here is a glorified dust cover with three or four set screws and it's dead easy. You just undo the screws and lift it out and then you're looking at the guts. But in this case, there's three set screws on the outside and three set screws on the inside of the registration face. They're not on the fa the registration face, they're just inside where the registration bizzo is. And you've got to undo all six. I'm going to leave the uh, pins in place because they don't need servicing, they're working just fine and they're not really subject to any wear and tear, you know, they, they just sit there. So I'm not going to bother pulling them out. When you get them all apart, you think to yourself, well, how do I split the case, <laughs> right? The easiest way to split the case is that there are two holes on the back of this chuck that aren't doing anything, and one of them is right there. Okay, you can probably see that. There's another one diametrically opposite. So there's these two holes on the chuck that seemingly don't do anything, except when you get all the set screws out, they're designed to allow you to push the end cap off the main body of the chuck. So you just find yourself, in this case, a couple of M5 set screws that are kind of the right length. You just get them in place with the set screws out, and then you just wind them up gently a bit on, a bit on one of them, and then a bit on the other one, and then back to the first one, and then back to the second one, until the whole thing just lifts off. Now, if you don't know that, it might be extremely, tempting, I think, to start hitting something with a hammer, which is almost, but not quite, always a mistake. Get one of these little trays too for all the parts because they can't go astray if you do that. They're magnetic, you know, it's hard to lose the bits. They all stay together, they wait patiently for you. It's fantastic. All right, so the soft face thing, okay? If you've got to hit something with a hammer, which you don't in this case, but if you've got to, 
There's never do it with a hammer like this. Just do not do it with your regulation engineering type ball peen hammer. That will end in tears. They got their place, certainly, but their place is not hitting anything precision. That's why, excuse me, that's why God made the brass hammer, of which there's a couple of variants on the table just here. Um, even better, the copper hammer, the Thor copper hammer is just a thing of beauty and a joy to use. Copper, of course, is softer than brass, so it's pretty good. You can use a sort of plastic hammer as well. This is just a regulation S-wing plastic hammer. This one's pretty interesting. It's a dead blow. So it's got steel shot or lead shot or something inside it and these, whatever they are, nylon or acetal faces and they are almost guaranteed not to mar anything metal. So that's always good. Or you can just get one of these as well, you know bit heavier, same basic deal. It's just much less likely to end in tears if you use something like that. Now, when you're working on the bits, the first thing you've got to do is get the pinions out. And there's some set screws there that just float. They're not tight. They just float there. So look at where they are as you pull the chuck apart because that's where you're aiming to put them back together. They've got these long pins on the nose and all they do is ride down into a groove in the pinion and stop the pinion from falling out of the chuck, which would be a disaster. When you think about it at a thousand RPM, you really don't want that and neither does your next door neighbor, I'd suggest. When you get the pinions out, what you're faced with then is getting the gear wheel with the scroll on the other side out. So what you do is, you flip the chuck, okay, and then you're looking down on the top of the scroll and it might be tempted to get in there with something and punch it down as well, which is why God made the set of brass punches for disassembly that are much less likely than anything you can dodgy up out of steel to wreak havoc with a precision manufactured part like the scroll. Even better, you can go to the local scrapper and find yourself a bit of off-cut copper that was just thrown away by some fabricator of god knows what and you can use that so that'll be the softest option for punching anything out the, the gear wheel's not in there particularly uh, tightly but it is a precision fit so it's easy to kink it a little bit so just tap it on one side and then tap it gently around you'll feel it moving down eventually it'll fall off but Mechanical sympathy is a thing when it comes to pulling things of this nature apart and it's really important not to be heavy-handed because you want it to go back better than when you put it together, not worse. That is kind of vital. What you're looking at here is a 10-litre Vivor ultrasonic cleaner. And i got to say, I was pretty sceptical when I first heard about ultrasonic cleaners because it does sound a little bit like snake oil, but you know what? They're really good. They're really good because you can do something else while they're doing their thing. They're very effective. They get down into every little tiny crevice of anything that you put in them. And you can use any kind of solvent. In this case, it's kerosene, but you can use degreaser or anything else you want, basically. You could even use vinegar if you wanted to dissolve the mill scale on some small pieces of mild steel before you were going to weld them or join them together or whatever. It's a very versatile tool and it works really well. 10 litres is big enough for most of the jobs I do around here. You can see how it goes fitting all of the disassembled parts of the chuck in it here. They make them bigger and smaller, obviously. It takes about 15 minutes for the process. You can dial it in, it's on a timer. And after that, all the parts just come out, you blow them more or less dry with a compressor and you're basically just good to go again. And when you want to get the Kero out, there's a cock on the back of the ultrasonic cleaner, it's got a hose on it, you just let gravity do the work and you decant it back into the original container and then you just hang on to that and it's good to go again next time. And obviously around here bench space is a bit limited so I tend to put the ultrasonic cleaner away and just drag it out when I use it every few weeks. And what that means is that I want to get bang for my buck out of the amount of work I've had to do to deploy the cleaner and get it full of whatever solvent. So 
I had four new one, two, three blocks and a new uh, clamp style knurling tool plus a quick change tool post and four holders that are going to go on the lathe over there. And when you buy this new machine tool stuff, it just, I think 25% of its transportation weight is the grease that they pack it in to stop it rusting. It's like this horrible, waxy, cosmoline crap. And it's really hard to get rid of it, except in an ultrasonic cleaner, the kerosene just rips it away and the ultrasonic waves do their thing and then Bob's your mother's brother, so that's fine. There's a link in the description to the ultrasonic cleaner. They come in all kinds of different sizes. I'll put 10 litres and 15, and I think they do a 30 as well. The 10 litre one is under 200 bucks. If you use the link in the description from Vivor, you'll get 5% off, and the other ones will be the same 5% off deal. So, you know, for under 200 bucks, it really does save a lot of elbow grease and a lot of hands immersed in kerosene or some other vile solvent and a lot of work with the toothbrush that ends up in a result that's still not as good as the result you would have got using the ultrasonic cleaner. So anyway, I'll put a link in the description there. I only recommend tools and things of this nature that I actually use and two thumbs up for the ultrasonic cleaner. Now, all the, all the screws, when you put it all back together, we're talking about reassembly, all the, screw, the, the screws <laughs> and the screws get a little drop of oil. And I just use this crappy Castrol handy oil, which my mommy would have called Singer sewing machine oil in the olden days. It doesn't really matter what the grade is. Just put a little bit of lubricant on it to make it easier to get a part next time. And so there's no galling over time and less corrosion if it's all together for months and months in a humid environment. So a drop of oil on that. The pinions and the wheel that they mesh with, they all get a little bit of grease. And here I'm just using this red and tacky, high temperature, high pressure grease. I don't know how good it is, who cares? It's not exactly a high performance component. And I'm just putting the Goldilocks little smear on with one of those dodgy little brushes. You know those little brushes, you get a big packet of them on Amazon and you throw them away when they get gungy. Just use that and a little bit, okay? So the pinions and the gear wheel, including the little spindle at the front of the pinion that engages into the monoblock of the chuck. It's important to get grease on that. And then basically just use this little electric drill to cycle the whole gear train with the grease on it. And I'm only doing that to make sure that the grease gets fairly well distributed before reassembly because once it goes back in you can get in a situation where you're doing repetitive jobs and the chuck's only moving in and out a few millimeters every time as you remove one part and put a new part in so that might not distribute the grease well enough to be uniform and i'd like to have the grease on there uniformly when it starts to fill up with chips again because i think the grease is a little bit of an uh, advantage there the other side of the chuck, the side with the scroll and the slideways and the jaws, everything there just gets a little spray with SX90 Plus and it's a really easy way to get just a thin smear of oil on everything more or less uniformly. I really like that stuff. The obvious point to be made about oiling a chuck is bees dick, dude. That's all you need, just bees dick because if it's a sewer, in there, literally, of oil. The first time you spin the chuck up, the spare oil is just going to eject itself out of these slideways, and if any is leaked down into the bottom section, it's gonna eject itself out of the holes where the pinions are, and it's gonna fly all over, including on you, if you're dumb enough to be standing in the plane of rotation of the chuck of the lathe, which you should never do. You should be looking at the chuck rotating like this, and working over here just in case anything comes loose and then whew, it's gonna miss you. So if you stand there and you over oil the chuck and you see a big band of oil up your left shoulder, not only did you put too much oil in the freaking chuck, dude, you're standing in the drop zone, like in the danger zone of anything that goes flying because your setup is dodgy or for whatever reason, okay? The obvious projectile is 
the chuck key, but you should train yourself to feel physically ill if the chuck is in situ, the key is in place, and your hand comes off it. If that ever happens, you should feel nausea, <laughs> okay? It should be that Pavlovian. Good safety tip. The chuck key is a big, heavy, spiky projectile, and you do not want it spinning up to 1,000 RPM and hitting you. That would end badly. Or some other poor bastard working just over here, like... Especially in a workplace, that sort of stuff is verboten, but you have to be your own safety Nazi in an environment like this. So, okay, there's a lot of debate out there. I know in machining forums about lubrication of chucks, there are staunch advocates for none and staunch advocates for grease and staunch advocates for oil. I cannot have a strong view about any of this stuff like if this really matters to you okay dude let me have it in the comments but I give you my solemn promise not to give a shit my own view is that chips going in here are inevitable if it is dry it is far more likely that they will wedge in place and gall themselves in if you have to crank the chuck really hard to either do it up or undo it in those circumstances and that's worse than moderate lubrication. And you're entitled to your own view on this. I'm entitled not to entertain it. So there's that. Now, this chuck also has an oiling point. It's got this uh, oiler built into it right here, which implies to me at least that the factory seems to think that oiling a chuck might be appropriate. The only problem with having an oiler here is that unless the chuck is sitting physically down on the bench like this, there doesn't seem to be much point to oiling it, does there? Because if it's actually sitting in this orientation, like on the lathe, and you put your oil can up to it and squeeze a bit of oil in, all it's going to do is fall down to the outside and not lubricate the scroll. So there's that. And for this reason, what I'm going to do is if I think a little bit more oil is required, I'm just going to back the jaws out and give it a bit of a squirt with the old SX90 Plus because that's the easiest way to deliver oil directly onto the scroll. And there's a lot of dust in machining too because you've got rusty parts and you've got cast iron parts which are very sort of powdery and dusty to machine and then you've got mill scale which inevitably yields dust when you cut through that on the outside layer of anything hot rolled. So there's also going to be dust that gets in there. There is a burden of ongoing lubrication. So in practice, that's what I'm going to do if it gets a bit gummy. Now, the ring gear goes in first. It's a tight slip fit, and that means you've got to finesse it on. You shouldn't have to hammer it on, but the tightness of that slip fit means that it's easy enough to kink it one way or the other and have it kind of bind. So you'd want to avoid that. So just be gentle with it on the way through. Mechanical finesse is a thing. And... The scroll obviously goes in face down. And the next thing that goes in is the pistons. So you slip all of them in. You make sure that the, the snout of each pinion, where it's got uh, that basic bearing surface that goes into a recess in the monoblock, then you make sure that that's got ample grease on it because that is carrying rather a lot of load when you crank down on the chuck. Good idea to make sure that's lubricated. And then you put those set screws that retain the pinions in. It's kind of important to remember not to crank them down tight, just have them floating at neutral buoyancy where you took them out. In practice, they won't bottom out. I don't know what it is about that mechanism, but they're just meant to float there. And obviously, when you get the chuck back together, they're hardly going to fall out because there's an end cap that just stops them from unwinding themselves. And when that's all together, just make sure that the whole thing rotates freely and isn't jamming up. It's a really good idea to double check those set screws, particularly if you've got a messy workshop environment where you might not notice any spare parts. Because if you've got grease there and it holds it all together and those retaining screws for the pinions are not in place, what's going to happen is you're going to spin the chuck up the very first time and the pinions are all going to eject themselves in the plane of rotation, which doesn't sound like fun to me either. So don't do that, okay? I just, uh, when I got it all together, I cycled it backwards and forwards several times just to distribute the grease as discussed. So after that, 
the backing plate's going to go on, okay? And it's also a pretty tight sort of slip fit. So what I did there was I backed the set screws out that I used to press it off, and I just got the set screws that hold it in place on the outside. I just got them started. And then I just got the inside one started. And then I went round gently a couple of turns at a time, just tightening down the outside ones after removing the pressing off five millimeter set screws. So once the outside was tight, I just used uh, the different Allen key to do the small set screws on the inside of the registration area there. And essentially then the chuck body was back together. And uh, I guess the other thing to mention is this little tire lever is just so helpful when you're doing uh, this chuck repair because Otherwise, you've got to get down here and try and counter-rotate with one hand. Whereas, when you're assembling it, you can just jam it in like this. And the curvy bit on the lip fits brilliantly on the pins for the cam lock. And it just holds it in place and counter-rotates against whichever way you're moving the set screw. Right. So, in this case for tightening or in this case for unscrewing. It's a brilliant little arrangement. They're dirt cheap as well. So... I'd be getting one of those for this kind of job if you're planning on doing it. I just had it floating around, so it, it just works well. One of those improvised little tools you can use. I don't know if I mentioned it earlier either, but on the issue of registration surfaces, you can probably see just here. I've got a couple of V's stamped into the cap on the end cap and the body itself, just to make sure that it goes back the right way as well. The final job, of course, is just to get the jaws back in because otherwise you've just rebuilt a paperweight, right? The only thing you've got to make sure is to get the jaws back in the slots that they came out of. And I always put the jaws back, jaw number one first, then jaw number two, then jaw number three. I don't know if that matters. I've actually never tested that, but a toolmaker I used to work for taught me to do it that way. He said it was important. I never really tested it. I don't know why. I've always just done it that way. Perhaps it doesn't matter. But anyway, I do it that way and it works. So that's the way I'm going to keep doing it. So the basic process is the scroll has a start. It's got a pointy sort of leading edge. And what you do is you identify jaw number one and slot number one, and then you unwind the scroll until the leading edge disappears away from the slot back into the body on the undoing side. So you're unwinding the chuck. When that disappears, you put the jaw in, you jam it home, like you nudge it home against the scroll, and then you advance the scroll forward and you wait for the leading edge to grab the first slot on the tooth and start dragging it in. And then you just repeat that process. So you wind the scroll around until you see it in slot number two, then you back it off till you don't see it again, you jam jaw number two in, and then you advance the scroll until it engages with the jaw and the jaw starts driving forward. And then you do that again with jaw number three. You see the start of the scroll, you back it off, you jam in the jaw, you drive it forward, it grabs the jaw and drives it in, and you've got all three jaws installed. And then, just for shits and giggles, what you do is you wind the jaws all the way in, and if they all meet together at the center, congratulations, dude, you win a prize, okay? And the prize would be a cleaner, functional three-jaw chuck that no longer feels as if it's jammed, virtually solid, full of Satan's freaking fingernails. And with that, I think our work here is done.